Good evening. My name is uh, Pavel Demež. I am senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund from Bratislava. And it's my privilege that I have a chance uh, to spend the next 10, 15 minutes with the two heroes of this film. I was probably selected because for me, within GMF, Belarus, Ukraine, together with colleagues, Jörg Forbrick, Alina Inaya, their team, and the Balkan team, uh, led by Gordana Delic. This is part of territory where GMF has spent quite a lot of time, energy, and uh, I happen to be at that square, and happen to be at last performance of free theater, ever since I am persona non grata to Belarus. Andrei Sanikov, who was featured in that film, spent 16 months in prison after that movie. And we are lucky that there are Americans like Madeleine Sackler, who never been to Belarus but did great movie. Madeleine, why did you do this and what will happen? Because this was preview movies much longer. Yeah, so, so what you just saw was the first 15 minutes or so of a feature-length film. And obviously, you're a somewhat unusual audience for a film like this. You know, the real goal of this film is to reach a mainstream audience. So we've been very fortunate that the film was uh, picked up by HBO in the States, and we'll be seeing some theatrical and uh, broadcast runs around the rest of the world in addition to the film festivals. So we actually just came from London where the film opened the Human Rights Watch uh, festival there. And we'll be going for a screening at The Hague later this week. And then the film opens in theaters next Friday in London and will continue its run from there. So we are very excited to share the beginning of the film here, but uh, there's more that makes sense after that. There's an ending. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much, Madeleine, for uh, showing us preview. And Andre, three questions to you. Has anything changed since the movie was done? We had Tom Stoppard at uh, Brussels <coughs> Forum three years ago, two years ago. Uh, you couldn't be here because you were in jail, and last year you appeared here at Brussels Forum. What's, what is different today in Belarus? Uh, the situation has gotten worse, uh, and unfortunately the dictatorship that existed in Belarus is becoming even more ruthless. But uh, uh, since you asked what changed and what happened in Belarus, Maidan happened in Belarus. Because uh, after seeing the pictures of uh, square and the peaceful demonstration, you probably understand the feelings that we have when Maidan started, when Maidan developed, when Maidan achieved victory. And that's what's happened in Belarus. And, and it, even irrespective of the fact that hundreds, if not thousands, of Belarusians were in Maidan. And uh, one of the victims, I want to sound his name, Mikhail Zhiznevsky, uh, was one of the first victims of, of Maidan. So that's what happened, not only to Ukraine, but to us as well. And I think it is something that uh, we have to really cherish. And otherwise, we still have political prisoners. We still have my colleague, also presidential candidate, Nikolai Statkevich, in prison. We still have our well-known human rights defender, Alias Belyatsky, in prison, and 10 others. Mm -hmm. uh, surely, Ukraine resonates uh, at this year's Brussels Forum, and uh, Todd Lindbergh will come soon with a quartet of great speakers and discuss Ukraine and Eastern Partnership. Uh, how can Belarus become Crimea? Uh, it's, uh, you know, <coughs> Belarus, Lukashenko, you heard it, and it's true, and it's tragedy, is there for 20 years. And he started to build his system of dictatorship 
from the very beginning, almost from the very beginning. And it's, it's not the question about Crimea. It's not the question about the uh, repetition of this or that historic precedent. The question is, what can we all do today to save people in Belarus, save people in Ukraine, save people in Russia? Because I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we have to be not only very realistic and sober, but uh, we have to presume the worst case scenario. For me, since you mentioned Crimea, with the annexation of Crimea, Kremlin started to realize its plans to destroy Europe. For me, that's what we are talking about. And I think that uh, there, is, there is a comparison and there is no comparison. Last question and then there, are, there is opportunity for two questions from the audience. Uh, you heard today uh, answers of three secretary generals current and two former ones of NATO. Uh, you heard the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs and several others referring to uh, Ukraine and what should be done. From your point of view, you live now in Warsaw in exile. You can't be in your homeland. You surely follow Ukraine for a long time since you used to be deputy foreign minister in your country and you as young diplomat were part of preparation of uh, Budapest Agreement, which was about this, uh, I mean, removing nuclear weapons from Ukraine. Were you satisfied with some of the suggestions what the West should do vis-à-vis -vis Ukraine? Well, you, you know, it's, uh, I would like to repeat what I said earlier in the morning, that there is a very powerful school of thought and strategist, very knowledgeable, very well aware of the situation in the region in the former Soviet Union, that uh, somehow and they, they, do, they, do have, they do produce a lot of impact on decision makers, on policy makers. But somehow the obvious result of these strategies is, is that we are always surprised. And it started with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And the tendency continues today. We were surprised, the West was surprised when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. We, we had this feeling that it, it will happen, but apparently not everybody. That's why the chicken Kiev speech of uh, George Wood, the senior. And it continues today. Everybody was surprised when uh, uh, Yanukovych made a U-turn. Then everybody was surprised when Maidan started. Then everybody was surprised that Maidan prevailed. Then everybody was surprised that Russia invaded Crimea and Ukraine. So we, we have to stop this because it is a moment of truth today. If you want to know some answers, study the recent history of Belarus. Ask us what will happen. And don't comfort yourself that it will dissolve by, by itself. You know, because the situation is quite dangerous. But at the same time, it's quite promising. We can really turn the history and make it normal history for my country, for Ukraine. Today, we all depend on Maidan. Maidan, you know, Maidan, we never had such a phenomenon. Maidan created a world phenomenon, universal phenomenon. You know, the whole world, even, even Syria, tragedy of Syria, even Arab Spring could not compare with, with Maidan. Because Maidan gave, gave so much encouragement to all people all over the world. And that's why whatever Russian representative would say, the world is on the side of Ukrainian and politicians must help to preserve this encouragement, to preserve this feeling, to preserve this mood, which will help us also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. I think that with these you gave several good uh, thoughts for Vitaly Klitschko and others who will come on stage. But if there are two questions from the audience, either to Andre or Madeleine about the movie, and then Todd Lindbergh will bring his quartet and uh, will continue night owl sessions. I, I saw some 
hand over there. Please introduce yourself and put your question or comment. I'm Dan Rundy. Uh, I first learned about Belarus in 2005 through the hand of Pavel Demish, and uh, I was proud to work at USAID and help get that program started when I was in the Bush administration. So my, I'm so happy to see you, Andre, and I uh, really honor our relationship. And I still am going to make good on, our, <laughs> on our, my dream, and you know what I'm talking about. And I have a dream of, in a post-Lukashenko Belarus of uh, sitting in a cafe and, and drinking coffee with you and eating lots of cake. So you're all invited when it happens. You're all going right, to, on me, it's on me, and we can just take, take note, but we're, we're going to do this someday. But the specific question is, Andre, what, what do you need us, what does the United States and Europe need to be doing more of to help get freedom in Belarus? What, should we be finding more assistance for dissidents? Do we need to be putting additional sanctions on uh, the leadership of <coughs> Lukashenko? What more could we be doing to bring about a Maidan in Minsk? Uh, Andre, if a, a second question goes over there. Thank you, Pavel. I'm uh, Roland Freudenstein from the Wilfried Martin Center for European Studies here in Brussels. And, you know, the, the one part of the film that impressed me most was Andre's quote, um, besides all the artistic performances, was Andre's quote about Nove Normalne Evropejski Belarus. And my question is, how does that relate to the talk about um, geopolitics? about you know, geopolitics in the sense of Brzezinski, Kissinger, about like geography playing, playing such, a, such an important role. Isn't it the power of ideas that counts and not the geographic location of a country? I mean, is this really a, an east-west conflict or is this a conflict between people who want to live in a kind of rule of law based society versus sleazy authoritarianism? Thanks. I don't know why you ask questions when you know all the answers. <laughs> exactly then, it's, uh, it's, it's what, what's needed. Uh, more assistance for democratic forces, more assistance for free media, no games with dictator. Uh, I, I, I have it in two words, engage the people, disengage the dictator, and then we will see the results. As for this geopolitics, you know, that's what I was talking about. Uh, by now, we should have been living in a world with the arc of stability going through Germany, France, Poland, and Ukraine. It never included Belarus. And no, nobody ever asked us whether it's possible. If we were asked when these ideas were floating, we would say, no, without Belarus, it's not possible. Because if you take history, you will see that the crucial role was played by Belarus, the area of Belarus, in every war, in every major war, in, in conflict, in trade, everywhere. So to build some artificial uh, security architecture will not, have, will not be possible, simply will not be possible. So again, in answering your question, maybe it's, now it's time to really listen to what we are saying and help us to help you to realize the situation and the remedies, tools, and instruments for this situation. Okay, uh, I think we are at the end of our session, but there are two ladies in the room, which I do not want to uh, ask to speak, but if you could just stand, because you are heroes of this story. Natalia Kaliada who was seen in the film. <laughs> and Irina Krasovskaya, who is keeping Belarus alive all the time at Brussels Forum. There is Irina. <laughs> Here is. <laughs> well, <see. laughs> well, <laughs> Pavel, since you started to reveal the secrets, there is also Daniela Kaliada. <laughs> ah, Please stand up. <laughs> there is Daniela Kaliada. Yeah, here she is. <laughs> okay.
Thank you very much. And uh, since everybody was saying a few nice words about Craig Kennedy, without Craig, we would never start Belarus program. It required Craig, Carl, Bildt, and many others uh, to open up program for GMF. And we are very grateful that we can continue to do this. Until then, Randy and all of us will be invited to chapter of Brussels Forum, which will be in Minsk at one point. Thank you very much, Todd. It's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me invite my, uh, <laughs> my team up to the, uh, uh, to the dais. This is a night owl session. Uh, by custom, night owl sessions are off the record. We're breaking that custom this year. We're going to keep this uh, uh, on the record, and we're going to try to uh, uh, have as much uh, interaction as possible and make it as broad as possible. But also, since it's a night owl session, uh, the custom includes drinking. Uh, and so there is some wine, uh, and uh, we'll uh, invite you uh, to please uh, help yourselves to that. Meanwhile, I'm going to bring everybody up all at once. Uh, and we'll get, uh, we'll get started as best we can. I'll introduce the panelists when I call on them. I wanted to begin uh, with... Uh, I wanted to begin just with a... Uh, by reading to you something that uh, my friend and uh, Hoover Institution colleague and our former uh, ambassador uh, in Moscow wrote recently on his Facebook page, on uh, March 15th this was, and I thought it was an extraordinary statement uh, by, uh, by a former American diplomat, especially one so recently deployed. Uh, Mike wrote, I am very depressed today. For those of us Russians and Americans alike who have believed in the possibility of a strong, prosperous, democratic Russia fully integrated into the international system and as a close partner of the US, Putin's recent decisions represent a giant step backwards. Tragically, we are entering a new period with some important differences but many similarities to the Cold War. The ideological struggle between autocracy and democracy is resurgent protection of European countries from Russian aggression is paramount again. Shoring up vulnerable states, including first and foremost Ukraine, must become a top priority again for the US and Europe. And doing business with Russian companies will once again become politicized. Most tragically, in seeking to isolate the Russian regime, many Russians with no connection to the government will also suffer the effects of isolation. My only hope is that this dark period will not last as long as the Cold War. Michael McFall. We'll begin with uh, Vitaly Klitschko, joining us from the Maidan, chairman of the uh, Ukrainian Democratic Alliance for Reform. We've talked a lot already about Ukraine, but I think maybe you're uniquely positioned to tell us a little bit about what the mood and feeling among Ukrainians is now. Where are we? Where are we going to be going? First of all, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the chance to enjoy the panel. Right now, it's the most dramatic uh, time in Ukraine, in the history of Ukraine. From one side, we, have, uh, we are very happy. We don't have dictatorship anymore. Dictator left, and uh, democratic movement and, uh, in Ukraine won from one side. From another side, we talk about intervention in Crimea. We talk about instability in Ukraine, which uh, organized not just in Ukraine, we are more than sure it's outside from Ukraine, orange management, 
and mood. We have a uh, very mixed feeling, but uh, it's actually it's very painful what happens right now in, uh, in Ukraine. Right now, the Russian intervention in, in Crimea destroyed the system of Euro European security. It's not just problem of Crimea. It's not just problem in Ukraine. It's a problem of all European security. Just a couple of days ago, I was uh, in East Ukraine. I visited Donetsk. I visited Kharkiv. It's so interesting. Uh, so many people making meetings for United Ukraine, and some meetings make uh, people with Russian flags. It was very interesting to talk with the people. They I call political tourists. They come from Russia and support. Uh, some uh, movement to unite some east region of uh, Ukraine to Russia. From beginning, it's everybody have to understand, very short story. From the beginning, it was a uh, movement against a pro-European movement. And the government doesn't see don't want to see, don't want uh, to make reaction, and uh, the movement was against the government. But politician in Ukraine doesn't have to pre uh, present good quality of lives, can present justice, starting to play some game. Ukraine from uh, from different part of historical part, uh, different language part of Ukraine. Some part of Ukraine speak Russian, some part of Ukraine speak Ukrainian. We have different story and they uh, starting to talk. It's our language. It's not our language. It's our history. It's not our, our history. It's uh, our nation. It's not, not our nation. It's not our na nationality. It's not our nationality. And uh, it's the war starting. Starting not yesterday, starting a long time ago. Media war. The Russian media war uh, starting a long time ago and present everything what happens in Ukraine very in uh, bad light, in kind of nationalist, aggressive people, extremists come to the power. It's not true. The people come from whole Ukraine to the main square. This was European movement for Europe because we expect in uh, November uh, last year, Yunukovych signed a session agreement and actually we can make changes in our country and do it exactly the same way because the Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, Hungary show a good example of reform of changes and we hope. I am very unhappy to talk about Ukraine as a mass corrupted country in Europe, but it's true. We People told enough. Enough live with corruption. Enough live without rules. Enough live without future. And uh, first time, I think so in, uh, in the history, people died in Ukraine fighting for democracy under the flag of European Union. Today, uh, the main reason 
why uh, very unhappy is Russian Federation. Because government changed, and Russian Federation have a great idea to build, uh, to rebuild Russian Empire. Actually, it's to rebuild empire is impossible without Ukraine. It's Ukraine is very important part. But the Ukrainian government, the new government, it's pro-European, pro-democratic, and uh, the Russians not agree with that, and they were interested to make <coughs> destabilized the situation in Ukraine. Actually, what happens uh, in Crimea and what happens right now in east of Ukraine, it's huge influence in Russian Federation, no question. And uh, <coughs> our main goal right now, we're very happy. Today we signed political part association agreement. It means it's the first very important step already did. We have to do it a, a lot, a lot of changes, a lot of reform. And we shot, we show for, uh, in a short period of time, for people who make, who take part in a uh, criminal referendum, they do a mistake. If we make reform, if we make good standards of life and build infrastructure in, in Ukraine, new roads, it will be a good example because Ukraine have huge potential and uh, I hope we do it right now, everything to build uh, European standards of life, of life, its main goal of million of Ukra uh, million Ukrainian. And we can do that. Thanks for telling, that's great. Let me turn to Linus Linkevichus, the foreign minister of Lithuania. Linus, you've had uh, a frontline perspective on a lot of the questions we're looking at today. Obviously, we're in a period of crisis in a way that we uh, arguably haven't been, although we'll be turning to David in a minute and talking a little bit about the 2008 example. But maybe you could offer us your perspective uh, and uh, maybe uh, provide a little historical context for the discussion of uh, this question of uh, is Europe losing its east? Well, good evening as well. Uh, I'm asking my, myself uh, some questions I'd like all of us to ask ourselves. We can continue endlessly these intellectual discussions, but as we speak, uh, wrong things happening. And uh, let me notice that these things happening not for the first time, even not the century, not the first time. And when we, so my point is that, uh, and question is why, why this is happening, first of all, and second, what we should do in order to prevent. It's very easy. It would be able to uh, answer that would be f fantastic. Uh, first of all, why it's happening? I believe lessons are not learned. And uh, let me start just not with uh, 1938, not with the Anschluss. Let me start by 2008 in Georgia. And when I said that not once, at that time we were very concerned, as usually, uh, deeply concerned. Also, we had some meetings. We also made very important statements, decisions. I remember a meeting of foreign ministers of 2000, 2008, December, when we were quite clear what we would like to see Russia at that time to do, what we demanded them to do, what we asked them to do, and uh, nothing was done, frankly speaking. Not a single item was fulfilled. What is my point? Why, why, why others should respect uh, our decisions if we are not consistent ourselves sometimes? And this is also a lesson. So now, second attempt. Uh, of course, we cannot compare 100% what's happening. There are some discrepancies, but nevertheless, the scenario is more or less similar. Uh, my, my question is, uh, what if, again, uh, that will end up with, as one can say, a couple of sore faces, maybe some some, so to say, temporary defeat with regard to the uh, G8 format, now it's suspension, something else, and then back to normal in some time, because we're used to that. We are very pragmatic, we are very practical, and this is really, I'm not saying that we should be aggressive, no, not at all. I'm also not proud that we are now introducing this language of sanctions, 
Because sanctions is some, some like uh, last resort. So when you're talking to your uh, count counterpart and he's not listening or listening but not understanding, so then sanctions are introduced. So something, something is wrong in our system. Also, it reminds me uh, existing UN Security Council social regulations. Also not possible sometimes to take decisions. If we are uh, talking now on Crimea, but let's remember Kosovo. Let's remember when NATO jumped in too late, one can say, also without clear message or clear, so to say, decision of UN Security Council. And it lasted so long and genocide took place in the middle of Europe and we did nothing with all these intellectual di discussions, uh, all these uh, forums, organizations in place, no one uh, can do nothing and, and that that's also concerns me more than, <laughs> than the situation which is, which is now even because uh, to, to prevent what's happening is important but how to, how to prevent this precedent uh, to take place in the future because we are, have a lot of possibilities to proliferate this, uh, this, uh, this happening because a lot of frozen conflicts around and uh, it's not, not so difficult to look for them and to find them. So our task is of course to make full use of what we do have now not to under, underestimate uh, our opponents sometimes. Very briefly on Eastern Partnership Program. That was definitely not just another technical discussion on, on economical uh, integration or political association. It was geopolitical process, definitely. And, and sometimes uh, we were underestimating this because uh, rules are clear to everyone. I also said not once we are playing soccer, this clear game. Uh, uh, rules are also understandable, but other side also playing a, lit a little bit rugby, a little bit wrestling, and we have a s score like this. I'm not calling again to, 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 to of course, fair game is important, but uh, my point is let's, let's uh, take it seriously and let's uh, assess that our opponents not always playing fair game. And here, here we are in the situation when slogans are uh, very right, our statements are very good, that partners have right to choose the way to go, choose alliances. It's good that we're saying we have to respect this choice, but today it's very seriously uh, the issue stands that we have to defend the choice. The choice is not ours, but our partners, because otherwise credibility of our system, of our organizations, uh, which is supposed to be built on the foundation of values and principles, it's a, little, a bit undermined sometimes. And I'm afraid that if we'll not act to the extent so efficiently, we will have more events, more Crimeas. That's also bad news. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. So for me, very important to answer these questions, at least to think what we can do using existing leverages and mechanisms, and also to, to think very seriously what to, to be done in our system in order to make sure that uh, world peace order will not be challenged anymore. Thanks, Linus. Uh, let me turn to David Usupashvili, the chairman of the Georgian parliament. David, uh, was 2008 prologue to 2014? Do you see a straight line, and uh, where does it point from here? Well, I guess we Georgians feel a little bit guilty uh, with our, our Ukrainian friends. It seems that uh, together with others, we did not enough in order to uh, prevent this happening. Because even today, when we heard uh, very encouraging, great speeches of three secretary generals of NATO, and when the question was posted, what makes it different, events of 2008 and events now, and why then uh, the world reacted uh, as it reacted, I guess we did not hear convincing answer on this question. Because, yes, there was virtually no difference what happened in 2008. Russia's aggression was also tied to some process which was not in the plans of Mr. Putin. And that was NATO promise, NATO promising to Georgia that Georgia will become NATO member on Bucharest summit. And that was the timing when uh, Russia acted. Now it was related to the association agreement. Again, another project, another free choice of another free country to make its future. 
The preparation then and now were very similar. People who observed the situation then could remember many things. I will mention just one. As early as in April 2008, as soon as Bucharest summit declared that Georgia will become NATO member, the authorities of Stavropol Krai adopted a law and expanded its jurisdiction over Abkhazia. So it was happening there and we were observing that we, we were seeing that things were coming soon. There were military exercises at the, the border of Georgia and so on and so on. I will not talk on the some other issues of that, that, that conflict, but of course there are similarities. And there was military invasion, there was bombing of uh, the Georgian cities. There, there was everything. There was ethnic cleansing, burning of whole villages in South Ossetia, producing another t t tens of thousands of uh, internally displaced persons. So what happened after? Uh, I, of course, we remember very well, Georgians, that uh, on the level of rhetorics, we were hearing uh, almost the same things. NATO suspended uh, NATO-Russia Council uh, interaction. There were talks that probably Sochi Olympics will be b boycotted. There were other issues related to G8 and so on and so on. And where we ended? Let's remember what was the world look like before Sochi Olympics. Um, we Georgians decided to go there in Sochi. And uh, now I can tell this because there is no 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 reason to to continue playing. We invented reasons why we are, we are we are going to Sochi. We Georgians. We invented reasons saying that, well, sports should connect and this is demonstration of our goodwill and so on and so on. We invented these reasons in order to save our face and probably face of democratic world. Because when we checked among our friends, nobody else, no single country, no single leader was going to boycott those games or even raise the issue that uh, in 10 kilometers from the, that location, there is occupied Abkhazia, where Russia is building its military bases, not observing the major part of the uh, sarkozy medvedev agreement and so on and so on. This issue was already well forgotten. That's why we decided to go, because if we did not go, we would downgrade the problem of occupation of Georgian uh, territories to Georgian-Russian dispute over something. Because the rest of the world were concerned about gay rights in those months, which are very, very, very important. But probably sometimes we are more busy with some popular issues than more real substantial issues. I can tell you more. Now, as we are sitting here, it's Georgia who is punished by the Council of Europe for two years. We have a sanction and Council of Europe is not going to uh, have any major event in Georgia. Why? It's because of these occupied territories. Because we said to one Russian Duma member who is violating uh, the law on occupied territories and as Mr. Klitschko was saying, political tourists, yeah? We have a lot of them in Suhumi as well. And we don't, did not allow him to enter to Georgian territory. And because of that, because we restricted freedom of movement of a member of a parliament, of member of state, of Council of Europe, Georgia received two years punishment. While the country which occupies those, that territory, which is not allowing the people, hundreds of thousands of uh, people who lost their homes to go to their, their places, is not allowing us, Georgian members of the Georgian parliament, to, to go there, well, that country is not punished. So, we need to draw some lessons from, from this situation. And we are not in the position to come here in the heart of Europe and uh, kind of uh, give some uh, instructions or lessons how to behave and what to do and so on. Because if there was no Europe, if there was no NATO, if there was not the USA, 
there would be no Georgia at the moment. And the very fact that we still exist, this is because of these institutions and people who are in this uh, hall and in other capitals. But probably all these things could be avoided now and uh, it was possible. Because again, uh, the fact that Russia still occupies Georgian territories it's not only violation of the very basic principles of international law. This is something else. And it was very clear to observe and to see. Just pose the question, why Russia would need independent South Ossetia in the middle of Georgian state? But what's the reason? Who, know, who knows anything about this geography there and so? Well, one could say that Abkhazia could be uh, interesting for some other reasons, at least for touristic destination or something like that. Why this, this small land in, in the heart of Georgian state? What, what's, what's the meaning to, to announce there as independent state? There's only meaning. That this is the platform, platform, the, 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 the territory from which another jump would happen. And it, it, it was so easy and so easy to, to look to the map and to see that it's just tiny corridor. The direct distance is about 35 kilometers. This is between the uh, occupation line of South Ossetia and on the other side there are Russian military bases equipped and the, 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 the weapons are arriving there more and more and uh, Gyumri uh, military base in Armenia. So this, this, this 30 kilometers is this tiny corridor which still connects Europe to Caspian region, Azerbaijan, uh, Central Asia, and that, that region. If that is closed, and that was closed during the war, in 2008, because one bridge was blown up and it was done. So, my question is and was, and our question was and is, if uh, Mr. Putin understands the strategic importance of this small tiny land, let alone Georgians, their European aspirations, their uh, whatever expressed willingness to join Europe, NATO, many times uh, during many referendums, well, we are joking. We, we conducted our referendum for joining NATO 11 years ago. We are still knocking on the door and we don't know what happens there. Mr. Putin did all the things during 11 days, from appointing the referendum in Crimea and absorbing the territories. So, I believe at least now, uh, we all need to be more, <coughs> more responsive to the problem. Uh, and uh, the response, if it is directed towards uh, sanctions and other measures against Russia, I don't think that this will be enough or, or effective enough. There must be measures for not losing Eastern Europe until it is still available and to have more creative approach to the things from European Union and from NATO. Because again, it is still possible. But very soon we could see those same Russian soldiers backed by nuclear weapons in other territories as well. And we could have another uh, conferences and, and other discussions. Until those territories are free from Russian soldiers, we need to act. This is the lesson from 2008, and this is the lesson from Crimea. Great, thanks, David. Uh, let me turn to Kurt Volker, who's now uh, the head of the McCain Institute at uh, Arizona State University. We all know him as a former uh, uh, Yes Ambassador to NATO. Kurt, where do we go from here? Uh, I think that's the key question. The title of this panel, I think, was uh, Have We Lost Europe's East? Yes. And I think the answer is, the only answer is, not yet, but we could. 
And so we better make sure that we don't. And that's, um, you started this off, uh, I guess I need to talk about the role of the United States, the role of Europe. You started this off with Mike McFall's um, blog post. I think everything that was said in there could have been said about six, seven years ago. The only thing that's different is that they hadn't invaded Crimea yet. But everything else, we knew. And so when you talk about the role of the US or the role of Europe, the first thing is to ferret out the truth. You know, what do we actually see with our own eyes? What do we know? Uh, we see Putin cracking down on democracy domestically, shutting down NGOs, closing political space, putting pressure on neighbors, invading Georgia, and the two years of pressure on Georgia that led up to that. We knew all that. Uh, so the first thing is to be clear about that. And I don't think uh, that we lived up to that standard recently, but now I think we will. Um, second responsibility or role for the United States in Europe is to be clear about values, to be an advocate, to be speaking up on behalf of human rights, freedom, democracy. Don't let those things pass without comment. Let people know that we're on their side and push back when people are against them. And again, I think that's something that we need to relearn and to, to do. The third responsibility is to try to help protect the environment. Uh, and by that I mean a security environment, a political environment, where the people of Central and Eastern Europe and Far Eastern Europe caucuses get to make their own decisions about what their countries are going to be. It's, it's not the case that the US or EU can do that for them. It, it can't make Ukraine govern a certain way, it can't make Georgia govern a certain way, or anywhere else. But when there is outside pressure on that political and security space, such as we have seen from Russia, part of our responsibility is to try to push to keep that space open so those people have a chance. So I think in those areas, that's our role. Now you apply that to today, and we have a problem. Now Putin has already taken the military out of the box. So we're trying not to. We're trying to operate on the basis of sanctions and travel bans and political pressure, but he's already put the military out there. And when people say there's no military solution to this, there will be a military solution to this today if we just leave it as it is, because that's a Putin-driven military solution. Uh, so we have to really be aware of where we stand. Putin, in his goals, has been more bold. In his lines, he has drawn them much more sharply. His tools are much more blunt, and his tempo is much faster. And that's what we have to grapple with when we talk about a policy response. We've got to be faster, we've got to be more clear about our goals, and we've got to be stronger about pushing them. Um, I'm going to pause there because it's getting late. If we have a chance to come back to a question that Anne-Marie Slaughter asked earlier about the differences between Georgia and Ukraine, I'd like to come back to that. Well, we'll see if we can get to that. I thought we'd try a little word cloud. If I could ask the control room to put up the question, and I'll ask you to take out your electronic devices. And uh, I wanted to ask you the word that comes to your mind uh, in answer to the question, what uh, does Putin want? And as soon as we uh, get our uh, word cloud presentation up, uh, we'll invite you to uh, start by typing in your one word answer to this admittedly complex question. And please do so now, and let's see what comes up. Meantime, uh, I wanted to see if I could find uh, a couple of points on which uh, there's any disagreement <laughs> on the end. Well, OK. <laughs> Uh, I don't think people know how to do it. Well, we've got uh, we've got some we've got some interesting things popping around. Empires uh, catching on in the crowd. The reconstitution of empire power. Gay rights was mentioned. All right, power, empire, hard power. I think that's uh, the message of. Uh, uh, of the day. Now, uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, it's a little difficult to see from me, is, is Congressman Turner uh, present with us? Uh, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, we are going to open uh, the, uh, the floor to questions, and let me start with uh, Sasha Vondra. 
Sasha, you will identify yourself for, the, for everyone. Yes, Sasha Vondra. I remain to uh, stay silent today, but uh, with uh, thought uh, reading uh, the letter by Michael McFall, I think I can reveal the, some see my secret here. Uh, in fact, it will be five years right now when uh, something happened in the GMF offices. Uh, uh, later on Asmus, thanks God that he was there with us in the spring 2009. Myself, Adam Rothfeld, Istvan Germati, and few other folks, we were drafting here uh, the concept of this later famous letter to Obama. And this was a letter to warn President Obama, who just declared a, a reset, that it will not be a walking in the paradise with some practical recommendation. Then I was invited in June to the White House and for a discussion with Michael McFall. And those of you uh, have known uh, Michael, he, he knows how to be emotional. So it was for the first time and the last time when I had a real dispute in the White House. It was almost a physical, you know, he went ballistic in one moment because I was advocating uh, the letter. <laughs> he was advocating the reset. And at one moment he told me that, and the letter was signed by Václav Havel, like Valenza and others, so that we are the men of the 20th century and that we are living in the 21st century. Since that past year has, uh, five years has passed, and we could hear a lot of folks on the both sides of the Atlantic lamenting that Putin is playing according to the rules of the 19th century. Uh, it reminds me, you know, I have, somebody was talking about the Erasmus generation. I have my Erasmus student in my school. They are great, but they do not know anything about history. So, uh, a couple of days ago, we were playing Yalta 1945, according to the real notes, when, for, for example, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was lamenting that Stalin is playing according to 19th century rules too. <laughs> While the skeptical Churchill uh, did understand how the things are done in Europe and in the East in particular. So it leads me to a question to the panel, whether you believe you know, in dealing uh, with the East and in dealing with Russia in particular, whether uh, the equipment of the 21st century is enough. Because look, it's serious. If Putin is playing according to uh, the 19th century uh, rules and enjoy and 80% of support among its public, so it's worse off at least considering whether we should enrich our arsenal also with some older practices too. Let me take another question. Come. Hi, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Vladislav Nozemtsev. I am an economist from Moscow Russian Federation. Uh, I um, would like to congratulate Mr. Klitschko with a very good presentation. I should say that I 100% condemn uh, Putin actions in Crimea uh, because uh, for years the Ukrainians uh, organized quite well uh, government in Crimea. Uh, the Crimean Tatars, for example, a minority, enjoyed quite good uh, treatment under Ukrainian government. Uh, and so I think that the aggression in Crimea was really unprecedented and it has no any grounds for being made except of Putin's drive towards the restoration of empire. But my question uh, goes to our uh, Georgian friend. Uh, is it possible not to see the difference between the situation in Crimea where the peaceful rule was engaged by Ukrainians for more than 20 years and the situation in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where the Georgians themselves erased Suhumi in 1992, when the Georgians 
uh, when uh, uh, initiated the aggression against the South Ossetia. Uh, well before Putin when, uh, came to power in Russia in 2000, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia were de facto independent states and they gained this independence during the war with Georgia. Russians, in my opinion, uh, in my humble opinion, Russians in South Ossetia de uh, defended the South Ossetia civilians, which, uh, and they do not do the same these days in Crimea. The situation for me is 100% different. And when I condemn the Putin's behavior in Crimea, 100%, I repeat, I was quite solid there. Uh, I expressed several times my solidarity with Russian actions in South Ossetia in 2008. So can you comment on difference? Maybe difference in Putin's behavior, maybe on the difference in behavior of your governments, respective governments of Georgia and Ukraine uh, in this situation. Thank you so much. I would Shall I answer? Yes, I'll have to, if you care to. <laughs> well, my answer would be no comment. But well, you could leave it at that. No, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll still answer because, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem, and uh, I would advise everybody who thinks like that to uh, think once again. Uh, Abkhazia won the war with Georgia. Statement. Do you know who won the war with uh, Georgia? Who we are fighting in Sukhumi? Who separated the people who we are fighting? Who took out the army from Georgian uh, weapon, weaponry from Georgian uh, army? Who gave it to others there? And what was happening there? You know, this kind of simplistic understanding of the situation, that's the precondition of what you are seeing in Crimea. Because if you were on 100% on the side of Putin, yeah, that's what put, makes Putin Putin inside uh, Russia. Because there are 80% of Russians who now believe that Putin is right on 100% vis-a-vis Crimea. That's the problem. And if anybody does not see that, well, I don't think that we Georgians are able to reconvince or to, 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 to bring any other arguments there. And what was going on in the in, uh, Tsinwali region? What, what, what was happening there? Russian peacekeepers keeping peace there, being there for peace for the, about 18 years? And that, that was the reason. And that's how great Putin was behaving in South Ossetia, being concerned about human rights. And it's just Ossetians whose rights are concerning Mr. Putin. And it's not Ukrainians or others. And their rights are not uh, concerning for him. Well, this is the reason, again, why Putin is Putin. Thanks. Vitaly, let me ask you. Do you see the situations as essentially similar? Georgia 08, Crimea 2014? Uh, you're actually right. Uh, the Russian media works well. The propaganda works uh, much worse than uh, in Soviet time. I have a lot of friends in, in Moscow. They're very intelligent, it's, uh, like politics very much. But if I talk uh, with uh, my friends in Russia, uh, they ask me what was going on in uh, in uh, Kiev in Ukraine. It's uh, radicals there. It's nationalistic and fascistic people. It's uh, I told them, I'm sorry. I look like radicals. It's the people uh, fighting for the future. My people don't agree to with uh, to live with this uh, uh, rule of lies. And exactly this propaganda work in East and Crimea. The, work, uh, the propaganda work very good in, uh, in Russia. And right now, in this situation, what we have, uh, actually, uh, Ukrainian military base 
wait too long. They wait without action, uh, without, without defend. And actually today, uh, the last information, the Russian Russians get uh, all ships, all Ukrainian ships, in uh, black, in Crimea region, and uh, more and more uh, military bases. And to wait, we have to move away. We have to save um, the base, or we have to save the people, the military people, officer and soldier, and send the, uh, the continental ta uh, part of Ukraine. Or the people, the military have to defend himself, defend the territory, because we more than sure the Crimea still Ukrainian territory. We not accept this referendum. Referendum was anti-constitutional, anti against all rules of Ukraine. And uh, how, how can happen 97% uh, voting for, uh, for Russia, 300,000 Tatarian doesn't take a part, couple of cities they don't want to take a part in uh, uh, in this referendum. It's uh, they decide long time before referendum uh, decision. What was take a long time before referendum, and that's why I was just a couple of uh, days ago in military base in different part of Ukraine. I was very surprised. Good mood. And people and soldier and officer told, we are ready to defend our country. We are ready to defend our future. We are ready to fight. But uh, we are not aggressors. We, can, we are ready to stop aggressors. What happened next? The main goal of Putin, power, empire, but main goal not Crimea. Main goal not uh, Donetsk or Kharkov region. The main goal, main goal, uh, the capital of Ukraine, Kiev or whole country. And uh, if I told right now nobody uh, secure in Europe, it can happen with any country after Ukraine. A couple of <clears throat> uh, hundred years ago, the, the Poland was part of uh, Russian Empire. The next can be Poland or another country. This also happens. And that's why it's a question of security, not just for Ukraine and uh, for whole region and for whole European country. Thank you. Linus, you wanted to come in. Let's get some more questions. Uh, yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm just uh, reflecting what Sasha Wondra started to say. Which century we are, where we are, in which century. And I believe uh, before answering the question what the uh, current la Russian re leadership would like to achieve, we should uh, think about uh, a bit about our cu cultural interaction, so to say. Because my point is that it pre was premature to call for strategic partnerships. Because uh, we are perceiving things a bit different way. And sometimes uh, the organizations, uh, uh, they, they belong. They are good organizations, but organizations where they do not belong or do not have veto right, they are wrong organizations. And then we have started to say and word that to speak about new security architecture sounds very convincing, but that was perceived like new architecture uh, without NATO, without European Union, without possibility uh, to build these organizations on the foundation of values and principles. That was my point. And we were warning, but some of our colleagues said, well, maybe it's a good idea. And, and uh, another meanings, let's say peacekeeping, not necessarily those are best, the best peacekeepers who are taking pieces of land and keeping. It's not necessarily the case. <laughs> and <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Theresa Fallon, European Institute of Asian Studies. One of the questions I'm surprised no one has raised when you talk about the difference between what happened in Ukraine and in Georgia is nuclear weapons. Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons. That's a big you know, give, and 
the whole world is standing by and the ripples from what's happening in Crimea and Ukraine are, are passing through the world and turning into tsunami, for example, in Asia. What will this mean for North Korea? What will this mean for even negotiations in Iran? What about Taiwan, who's been kind of promised protection from the US if they never built a nuclear weapon? So I think there, there's a huge butterfly effect taking place here. And I am surprised that no one's even mentioned it. So how do you feel um, this will... Well, we'll consider this having been mentioned. Uh, Kurt, do you want to address the uh, fallout, excuse me, sure. of the uh, uh, nuclear pick uh, up, question? Uh, pick up that in a couple of things. I think you're absolutely right. So I think that any country that now has nuclear weapons or a nuclear weapons program is going to be much less likely to be willing to give them up uh, if uh, they think that it's their only real source of security. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing, I just wanted to add on to the question about Georgia, differences from Ukraine. Um, I think another difference, uh, one was the mandate that had the Russian forces in Abkhazia and South Ossetia before the invasion anyway. Uh, a second difference was a tendency among many people, especially in Europe, uh, but also elsewhere, to blame the Georgian government and to blame the Bush administration for being too provocative to create this condition. Um, and then a third difference is that the result thus far has been annexation in Crimea as opposed to supporting unrecognized, except for Russia, independent states in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But the similarity is Putin and his strategic objectives of what he's doing in his neighborhood. And I think that's the key thing to, to take away from that. Um, Charles Grant from the Centre for European Reform. I want to come back to Belarus, where I spent most of this week, and put a question to Vitaly Klitschko, but also if we can persuade Karl Bildt to chip in here about the EU's role. But one observation, one quick question. The observation is this. Um, it seems to me the Belarus economy is getting weaker and weaker. Uh, current account deficit could be six or seven billion dollars this year. This means that Lukashenko's ability to maintain his country's independence from Putin is reducing. Putin's leverage is perhaps rising, and the independence of Belarus is seriously under threat more than it has been. My question is what the EU should do about this, if anything. I picked up in Belarus from government officials a desire to try and tentatively engage with the EU. Uh, I picked up on the EU side some similar desire to do this. Clearly, Belarus is not going to move towards democracy. They might release political prisoners. Should we try and engage in Europe with Belarus to help its economy, to keep it out of Russia's clutches, or should we say no because you're not a democracy, so tough, we're not going to help? What, what's the answer? That was for... Uh... That was for the Okay. <laughs> Carl, I know you had your hand up. I, I understand, but apparently you've been drafted. Into, I have been into drafted, response. but I, I, had, um, I, I, I comment on what Charles said. But, but first, the fundamental difference between Georgia and Crimea or Ukraine is that in Georgia there was a conflict. I mean, mind you, the war in 2008 was a war, and the Russians did invade, but it was a frozen conflict coming from the early 90s. Uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia was outside of the control of the Georgian government. And then, I mean, Misha isn't here, but he gave his version, and I essentially agree with that particular version. The war occurred tactically, the Russians won, strategically, they lost because their main aim was not to get control of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. They already had that to some extent. Their main aim was to get regime change in Tbilisi, and they failed. The difference with what we are facing with now is there was no conflict in Crimea. There was nothing. It was a fairly peaceful place. Uh, and if you look at the opinion polls that were undertaken, um, the, the majority of the people identify themselves as Russians, they were, a lot of affinity with Russia, they felt culture, history, whatever. But if you ask the opinion polls prior to this conflict whether they wanted to be part of Russia, part of Ukraine, they were sort of reluctantly happy. Not happy with everything in Ukraine. If you go to people in northern Sweden, they complain about Stockholm all the time. And in the same way, they were complaining about Kiev in Simferopol. But there was virtually no feeling 
for getting away from Ukraine and getting it. So it was, there was no conflict. The conflict was created by Russia with the invasion. That's a fundamental difference. Carl, we will not count that as against the question that you will get to ask momentarily, but first I want to turn over to Lee. Then I Thanks very much. Lee, Lee Feinstein, Drummer Marshall Fund. I was the ambassador to Poland until fairly recently. Um, first, if I may, just a very brief comment on Kurt's point, who I usually agree with. But in this case, I think we want to be very, very careful about the lessons we draw about the Budapest Declaration, because the circumstances around 1994 were really very different. And we were in a circumstance where we wanted to withdraw the weapons back to Russia. We were actually less concerned about the inheritors of those weapons potentially using them. So I think this kind of Stephen Walt idea that, or John Mearsheimer, that you keep nuclear weapons and that keeps people out, I'm not sure that that really applies broadly, and I'm, I have real questions as to the degree to which it would apply to this situation. So I wouldn't want to, I'd want to be very careful before we start putting forward that hypothesis. But I did want to ask a question for uh, Mr. Klitschko and ask you uh, candidly, just in your judgment, what are the next steps for the opposition, broadly speaking? Uh, what's necessary for the opposition to do between now and the hoped for election uh, uh, on May 25th to be successful and to build the kind of transformation that, uh, that, that you've outlined. Sorry, we're not any more opposition. <laughs> <laughs> we, we come into the power, but anyway, the question uh, uh, what we uh, make is the next. Very important, right now, stabilize situation in Ukraine. First point. The second point. The Russia do it everything to unstabilize situation in the east of Ukraine uh, to send the people. That's why we close the board uh, of Ukraine between Ukraine and Russia. First point. The second point. It's very important to make right now clear vertical. In May 25, we have president election in Ukraine. It's very important to have uh, legitimate power in Ukraine as president, who is responsible for the country. It's the next step. Uh, <clears throat> regarding Crimea, uh, it's actually it was very important. Uh, the Budapest Agreement 1994. It's a good example for another country regarding uh, nuclear weapons. It's a uh, good example uh, to have uh, nuclear weapons, have um, uh, weapons which can support the country from, from another country. And right now, the question to the United States, they was part of this agreement, Budapest Agreement, uh, the, the, the Budapest Declaration, uh, Great Britain, and to keep the words, they keep the uh, uh, agreement, and if Russia bro uh, break all the rules in this game. Regarding, uh, regarding Crimea, main goal is peaceful territory, and we have to make demilitar demilitarized territory of Crimea. All military base Russians have to move from Crimea. And uh, the question of time when we return back Crimea to Ukraine, but we still, you, Crimea is territory of Ukraine. We not accept this referendum. It was against the rules, against all international rules, against constitution of Ukraine. The decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right behind the camera. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Giga Bokeria, uh, UNM, Position Party Georgia, for my Secretary of NSC. I think uh, Kadri had a very good observation uh, this morning, which now has been confirmed by our Russian economist friend's comments that 
There's a difference between how Putin acted in Georgia and Crimea, that in Georgia, Russia, not only Putin, has prepared all of this chemistry for 15 years and has worked meticulously to build up the legend, an excuse for invasion. Uh, well, in Crimea, they acted very quickly without any preparation, much more bluntly. And unfortunately, one of the conclusions clearly is that this boldness came out, at least partially, out of the perception in Kremlin that they paid a very low price for 2008 invasion. Very low price. And that's a very unfortunate fact, to say the least. Um, I think we should come back to the 2008, not only uh, at the moment when the invasion happened, but at Bucharest summit, because it was an important moment. Mr. Uspashvili spoke about a historic decision which summit made that Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO if they choose so. But I think, again, perception-wise, the summit delivered let's say so, a dual effect. The fact that Georgia and Ukraine were not given map and the resistance of very important uh, players in Europe created the perception in Kremlin that at least partially a huge part of free world, very important countries, were ready to accept that former Soviet Union, short of Baltic states, is Russia's backyard. I'm not saying it was intended so. I'm not saying that those countries who objected to Georgia's map were intending to send the signal, but unfortunately that was seen like that. And the danger is now, if the reaction towards this very blunt, very, very open uh, military aggression, occupation, annexation of Ukraine, if the reaction is not quick enough and not strong enough, and there was enough talk about that this morning, so I won't repeat that travel bans is a good start, but far from enough to hurt Putin's regime, for sure. But I want to bring back the NATO issue, and there's Minister Linkevich is here, and there's court worker who knows a lot, so I want to ask both of them, the minister as, as somebody who's inside the club now, and the court is somebody who knows a lot about it, where is the game play with NATO enlargement now? Because if the next summit comes, and there is no clear signal for Georgia in this case, because Georgia continues its course on NATO integration, and for Ukraine, if it chooses okay, to... Okay, we've, we've got the question on the table. That's great. Let's, uh, what will happen It's then? getting late, and I, and I really want to get some Thank answers. And I've, got, I've got a couple more people I want to get in. Yes, well, it's getting early. All right, fine. Uh, let's pick a question here. <coughs> Anton Aguardia, The Economist. I don't have a statement, but I have a, a couple of questions, if I may. <laughs> Firstly, uh, to Kurt, uh, you said something which I want to make sure we understand correctly. You said the lack of a Western military option means a, a military solution by default. What do you actually mean by that? What do you mean, what do you think the West or Europe and America should do about on the military side? Uh, to Vitaly Klitschko, um, your government, now that you're no longer in opposition, is being asked to do some very profound economic reforms by the United States, the European Union, and the IMF, including abolishing subsidies for fuel. Is that something that a government in, your, in the position of the current government can actually engage in? Is that something they can do? Is that not too difficult to do? And to Mr. Nankiewicz, if you could replay the videotape again, what would you have done that's different in the run-up to Vilnius? Should we start with those? The video play? Or... <laughs> okay, starting with uh, what Giga Bukeria said, uh, I, I already mentioned that in my view as well, the lessons were not learned, and uh, that was also kind of part of the uh, situation we have now. When it comes to Georgian case, I'm convinced that this is really, I don't know what will happen in consensus building process, but uh, sometimes uh, I also can repeat that we are doing sometimes too soft, too little and too late. This is true. And that's uh, lacking behind uh, the events. And this is really instead of acting on time and, and clearly. So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important to mention. When it comes to Georgian case, I'm convinced that uh, Georgia has in possession now all necessary tools with regard to NATO membership. It was set in 2008. It was repeated later. Georgia will be NATO members. So, so those who are doubting whether they will be, they can look at this decision. When they will be, when they will be read, read definitely. But they have all tools in the possession. They have NATO Georgia Commission. They have uh, uh, dialogue, annual national program. Uh, they, they, they have everything. Annual, annual national program has a structure same as membership action plan. For those who like membership action plan more, I, I, I doubt it's necessary for Georgia because they really do have everything what they, what they, what they need to have. And uh, their success will depend on political momentum. 
when political decisions will be made. So I would advise Georgians to, look, to, to work hard to continue with the reforms, and time will come. I, I, I have no doubt. When it will come, I don't know, but sooner than later. And you will be really eligible to be NATO members. And we will support you, of course, I hope, with, with all our colleagues as well. So this is the answer to your question. About video, uh, no, video would be the same, probably. I was very happy. I shouldn't say that I was happy with the Ukrainian case. Of course, we are all sad with what, what happened. But I'm happy that we made this program, Eastern Partnership Program, alive. Uh, and with the future, although there were doubts that it probably will be stopped or, or will be crashed because of these challenges. No, it's not the case. I'm happy because of Georgia and Moldova, because they really made a very important step during initialing of association agreement during Vilnius summit. And now I have no doubt in summertime we'll sign this agreement. If we'll do that, possible, of course. And that will be also extension for, for, for Ukraine, which they signed part of the association agreement, but in, in due course and soon. And I would wish you to do that as soon as possible to, 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 to accomplish all a single mechanism, including DCFTA, and start reforms immediately. You and Georgians and Moldavians, that will be irreversibility of the process. So I'm saying that video is the same. Video disclosed the situation, true, and also involved more my friends and allies into this debate. Because at the beginning of our story, uh, in, in the beginning of July, just few countries were talking about Eastern Partnership. Others were neutral, or, or so to say, I shouldn't say indifferent, but uh, were not very active. Now more and more countries are involved. We are sharing ownership, and this is good news. And also, I, I hope motivation also is here. Uh, but at the same time, I still believe we could do more, really. And our proactive approach is really needed, rather than wait and see approach. Because wait and see approach is prevailing up to now. We are waiting until something will be done automatically. At the same time, when opponents, you see how they are active and making all leverages and tools which are not acceptable in the 21st century. So we really should review our strategy to be more active. And, but this is not about the video of the past. This is about the video of the future. Vitaly on the uh, road ahead. Uh, very short, very short answer uh, for this question. Um, yes, uh, Ukrainian government ready to raise uh, to make the prices higher. We understand uh, that, and very important, uh, the Prime Minister announced already uh, this news. Uh, it's a very important uh, point to explain for the people uh, why we do that and uh, the reform, and people have to understand uh, it's important to make our econ economy com compatible with another one. One more question. I'm afraid we're running out of time. Um, I'm sorry, it's not the question. My name is Natalia Kalada, and I just want to comment on a Belarusian question because it was not answered, if I got correctly. Maybe I didn't hear the answer by anyone else. But as we started from Belarus and slowly moving to the end of the panel, so I believe it would be absolutely perfectly to comment on it. Uh, I honestly can't believe that there is a discussion about engagement from European Union side. And when Belarusian government is saying that they want to be engaged, I really can't believe that it's happening again. Uh, I think it's a nightmare uh, because this is exactly what was happening in 2010 when all European politicians, including Radoslav Sikorsky, coming to Belarus before the elections, saying that we're very happy to engage with Belarusian dictator. 2,000 people got arrested in about a month, I believe, so when we had the presidential elections. It was the bloodiest crackdown in the history of Belarus, with people in jails, tortured, taken from cells from KGB, stripped, stretched, electroshocked. Still people are in Belarusian jails. In December, when all Ukrainian events started to happen, we personally started to write letters to European and American politicians saying, put sanctions now, otherwise people will be killed in Ukraine. 
what's happened, waited, people killed, sanctions in place. Are we going to repeat it again? It's not possible. The only solution here is just do your job to the end. Just deliver that. It's Eastern Europe, and it's not solved yet. And it's not possible to believe that all of it is happening two hour and a half flight from Brussels. And people are still fighting, people are still dying, they are dying in jails, they are dying in the streets. So even though that politicians don't like sanctions, so finally it came that particular moment, either you do it or there will be a war. Well, our topic tonight has been, uh is Europe losing its East in a way it's been the topic for the entire day. Uh, I think that there is a detectable, palpable energy level to the discussion that we've been having over the course of this day, and I think that's because of the awareness uh, that the stakes are very high and uh, that this is worth, uh, so to speak, a fight. Uh, not necessarily in the sense of a military confrontation between East and West, but certainly in the sense of uh, uh, resistance to uh, an aggressor. And uh, with that in mind, I would like to ask the control room just to put up uh, one question that we can vote on uh, on the way out today. Uh, and uh, that question is uh, Putin versus Klitschko. Who you got? We'll be voting for 15 seconds. Vitaly, go ahead. He's not running for very, Russian president. Very, very, very interesting. Exactly the same question we have a couple of months ago, but uh, instead Putin was in a coach. <laughs> But he's not running for Russian presidency, he's running for well, Ukraine. Well, we, 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 it depends. I, I think, uh, I think, Boxing I think or the, wrestling? I think we have, the, we have a confrontation going on. In, in Boxing or wrestling? All right. Uh, well, the, the winner and still champion. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Kurt, to David, to uh, Linus, to uh, Vitaly, and thank you all. Uh, 